Good morning. This morning's reading is in Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. This is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring, bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed, and he will, put, he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not grow weak or be discouraged until he has established justice on earth. The coasts and islands will wait for his instruction. It's God's word. Thank you. Uh, good morning, church. Uh, happy New Year. Uh, my name's Matt Reed, and I lead the youth group here at City Light South. Uh, I work with middle school and high school students and also do a number of little things around the building. Um, I'm also commonly referred to as the youth guy. Um, so if you ever hear anybody saying, like, the youth guy, he's so cool, he's really awesome, or maybe it's, it's probably more like, don't worry about the trash, the youth guy will take it out. But... Um, <laughs> On a more serious note, um, I'm super grateful um, since I've started here in August uh, that I've been able to be cared for by so many of you, uh, and I'm thankful for this church and the leadership. And I'm also grateful this morning that I get to teach uh, God's Word. Uh, over the last month, we've been celebrating the birth of Jesus, the, that God became a man and dwelt among us, that the Messiah, the Savior, was born, that Jesus would become the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 in order to pay for the sins of the world. And this morning in Isaiah 42, we're going to be looking at Jesus in his role as a servant. So who the servant is, what he would accomplish, and how he would accomplish it. From these four verses, my hope is that we can see and understand that Jesus brings justice through servanthood. It's important for us to understand this as Christians because we must see how Christ is gracious in his service and how that affects our relationship with him and our relationship with other people. So Jesus brings justice through servanthood. And as we walk through this passage this morning, we're going to see that Jesus is God's servant, that he's gentle and steadfast in his service, and that Christ continues his service in and through us. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning as we open up your word, I just ask that you would illuminate our eyes to the truth that you are a servant king, that you um, serve us, and that uh, we ultimately will serve you, uh, and that we do serve you. So Lord, as we open up the word, I just pray that, that we can be able to understand you better and, yeah, worship you for it. So pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, like I said, the passage is Isaiah 42. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open it up. If you have your phone, you can use a Bible app, open up to Isaiah 42. Uh, and there's also Bibles in the back, free Bibles. We don't want anybody to not be uh, without a Bible, so we want everyone to have a, have a Bible. So feel free to grab one at the back. Uh, like I said, Isaiah 42, it should be about in the middle of your Bible. If you've gone to, to Jeremiah, you're too far. And so, uh, making sure we can get there, we're going to look at the first part of verse 1. This is my servant. This is my servant. At this point in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah is writing to Israelites 150 years in the future who live in the distant land of Babylon and have been exiled from Israel. And God is speaking through Isaiah to comfort Israel as well as the nations and tell them that God will bring all people to himself through his servant, the Messiah. And what we see here in verse 1, God is announcing to Israel and the coastlands, that's all people of all nations, that we should look to his servant. God is saying, behold my servant, look at him, feast your eyes upon my servant. And God is calling out to the world to turn their eyes away from the created empty idols of man and turn to 
the eternal Son of God. But the Son of God did not come on his own mission and by his own strength, but by God the Father's. We can see here in this first section that Jesus is God's servant. So let's look at the next few phrases in verse 1. I strengthen him. This is my chosen servant. I delight in him. My, I have put my spirit on him. As God's servant, Jesus works by God's strength and his spirit. He's chosen by God, and he is delighting to God. In the Gospel of Matthew, there are multiple times when God makes it known that Jesus is his servant. And one of these examples is at Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3. And in that section, it says, When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water, and the heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. In this passage, we see very clearly the fulfillment of the beginning of verse 1 of Isaiah 42. And we can clearly see how Jesus was strengthened by God in his spirit. I have put my spirit on him. That's Isaiah 42. He saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. That's Matthew 3. In the baptism of Jesus, we get to see each person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, playing an active role. And by God the Father and God the Spirit, God the Son was strengthened. See, immediately after his baptism, Jesus went into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. In the wilderness, Jesus was faced with each and every instrument of corruption that is at Satan's disposal. And Jesus fought back, and he won. How did he fight back? With Scripture. With every attack attempted by the enemy, Jesus shielded himself with God's Word. God was leading him and giving him strength in that. And the Holy Spirit was reminding him of Scripture and gave him the power to resist sin. Jesus never wavered from the plans of his Father. And he was chosen for this. This is my chosen servant. Before Isaiah 42, Isaiah refers to the nation of Israel as God's servant. And throughout the Bible, God refers to Israel as his children and chosen people. They were a people chosen by God and set apart by him. As God's chosen servant, Jesus is the one who is ultimately set apart by God. As the actual son of God, Jesus is the better Israel. Sorry. The servant would serve God in a way that Israel could not, and he would fulfill all that Israel could not. While Israel continued walking in sin and was an abomination to God, the servant would be a delight to God. In verse 1, God says, I delight in him. This word delight is so significant. When we think about a servant and who they serve, oftentimes we probably think about an employer-employee type of relationship. And in our life, it's common for us to equate one's worth with one's work. Maybe growing up in school, teachers liked the students the most who participated in class, did well, and worked hard. Maybe at work, bosses favor those with the best sales numbers, the most clients, and the highest customer feedback. While God was most certainly well-pleased with Christ's work, God is most delighted in the Son himself. See, this was not just an employee. This was the Son who dwelled eternally in communion with the Father before time and before anything was created a perfectly unified, eternal relationship. This was a son who God adored, admired, and dearly loved from forever ago. Colossians 1 says that in Jesus, he is the one by, in, through, and for whom all things were created. And God was well pleased for his fullness to dwell in him. This is Jesus. And Jesus is God's servant. But for what? What was his service to God 
that he was going to accomplish. Let's look at the end of verse 1. He will bring justice to the nations. In this passage, the word justice is repeated three times throughout. It's clear to see that the role of God's servant was to bring justice. But we must understand that God's justice is different than our own. While we do have a sense of justice, we're also flawed people, which means that we have a flawed view of right and wrong. We often see justice as fairness and equality, and it's always according to our own standards. Our standard of right and wrong is often guided by our perspective and worldview. Families have different house rules. Religions have differing values and morals. What's legal in one country is illegal in another. Humanity doesn't really have real clarity on what right and wrong is. But God has one standard of justice. Romans 2 says that he judges by truth. And this truth is his truth, the one and only truth of his word. God is perfect, which means that nothing can be added or taken away from him. And that includes his law and how he executes judgment. Think about lying and its consequences. If you lie to your kids, you may have to just tell them you're sorry. Now, if you lie to a friend, you might have to have a conversation in order uh, to restore your friendship. If you lie to your boss, you may get reprimanded. But what would happen if you lied to the Supreme Court? That's perjury. That's jail time. That's a lot of fines. And so in that, we see that the action was the same, lying, but who the offense was against meant a more serious consequence. Think of the consequences for an offense against a completely good, holy, just God. All sin and injustice are against him. Because of our choice to sin and choose what we think is right, Justice for us means death at the hands of a perfectly just God and eternal separation from him. We're in trouble. We're in trouble, friends. God fulfilling justice means that we will either face his just wrath or that someone else will for us. See, God loves what he has created, and he wants to restore all that has been broken by sin. And that restoration takes place through his justice. And he willed for justice to be established by the Messiah, by his servant, God's king, whose reign would be forever. And Isaiah tells us that this king would not treat those on the hard side of justice in a way that we typically expect from a king. Let's look ahead in the passage. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed, and he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not grow weak or discouraged until he has established justice on earth. So we know who the servant is and what he's doing. The servant is God's son, the Messiah, and he's bringing justice. Now we will see in the passage how the servant actually works. We will see how Jesus actually carried out his ministry. And from these verses, we see that in his service, Jesus was gentle and steadfast. Look at the beginning of verse 2. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. Right here in the first line of verse 2, we can already see that Christ is gentle in his service. God was just making this glorious announcement of his servant that he was strengthened by him, the almighty, all-powerful God. The servant is God himself and has all the power that God possesses. He's powerful. When we think about leaders in power, we may think about loudmouthed kings who rule with an iron fist. We think of merciless rulers that want to rule their people by way of oppression. We think of a loudmouthed man with no discretion. We can imagine him constantly looking for chances to flaunt his power, waiting for the next moment to bring justice through punishment and showing his intolerance of lawbreakers through prison sentences and executions. Even in the moments where he shows mercy, he's saying, see, 
I show mercy. You're lucky I'm a nice guy today. And the people submit to him because they're afraid of his terror. But this is not the way that Christ serves his people. Jesus was quiet and meek and in his obedience to God's will. He will not cry out or shout. Even in the moments where he reveals his power in the most, power the most in the gospels, he was discreet. How often do we see that after he heals somebody, he tells them to tell nobody? After the transfiguration, when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in his glorified state, standing next to Moses and Elijah, two of the most famous prophets, submitting to Christ, he tells them to tell no one until after he's been raised from the dead. If Jesus was anybody else, he would have told them to tell everyone, tell them I'm the Messiah. I can be king of Israel now. Let's go take out Rome. Come on, let's go destroy the Romans. But instead, Jesus healed the blind man and said, be sure to tell no one. And in that, we can see who Jesus was gentle with. Let's look at uh, verse 3. He will not break a bruised reed, and he will not put out a smoldering wick. In the bruised reed and smoldering wick, we see Christ's gentleness on full display. A reed is a type of grass. Now, I'm no expert on grass like Alex thinks he is, um, but I do know that it's pretty useless. Uh, it's, it's, see, it's not like a tree that provides wood or shade or shelter, and it's not a crop that produces food for us either. Virtually, it serves no substantial value, has no substantial value. A bruised reed is on the verge of breaking, dying, and withering away, making it even more insignificant. Not only is it useless, but it's also injured. Bruised reeds are those of us who feel ready to fold under the weight of our sins and circumstances. Maybe you feel unlovable. How could God ever love me? You know, I've heard it a thousand times, but I don't believe it. God just has to hold up his end of the deal because I believe that Jesus is Lord and that he was raised from the dead. God, see, God tolerates me, but he doesn't actually love me. Or maybe you're seeing sin more in your life than ever. You fell back into that sin that you swore you'd never fall into again. You lost your temper. You looked at something you shouldn't have. You said something that you shouldn't have. You can't seem to change, and you're just ready to give up. Maybe your life is falling apart. You lost your job. You have no idea how you're going to pay your mortgage. Your parents said that you're a failure. You don't know if your marriage is going to make it. You have no friends. You seem more lonely than ever. We are people who carry heavy burdens. We are indeed bruised reeds. However, rather than breaking bruised reeds, Jesus heals them. In his service of justice, Christ is bringing restoration to God's creation, and he's making all things new and perfect and holy. And that includes us, if we're believers and followers of Jesus. God's servant is in the service of fixing those who believe that they're broken beyond repair. Jesus wants to meet you in your hurt, just as he met the woman at the well in John 4. A woman that would have been seen as a promiscuous outcast. She had five husbands and would have never been the person that you would imagine the holiest person ever would be spending time with. Yet, Jesus meets her at the well and asks her to give him water. And Jesus didn't just ask for her service. He also offered his own. He offered living water that would never cause her to thirst again. The woman who would have never stepped foot in a temple. The woman who had searched for comfort her entire life, but had none. Jesus offered this woman something better than she could ever imagine. He offered her life everlasting. 
He offered his grace through justice and a relationship with God. Christ, at the first hint of us taking interest in him, at the first smallest sign of us saying, Jesus, I want to want you. He's saying, take all of me. Here is all of me. Here is my living water. Let me heal you. Let me cleanse you. And he's just as gentle with the smoldering wick. He will not put out a smoldering wick. This, a smoldering wick, is burning in the slightest sense. You can tell that it, there's a spark present, but only because of the smoke that's rising from the wick. The spark looks as if it's about to go out. It provides no heat and no light, only the smell of ashes. Smoldering wicks are those of us who know Jesus and yet feel like we're fading and going out. Maybe you're a Christian, a new Christian, and your new faith in Jesus is the only thing that you have to hold on to. But it's tough. You're trying to learn and understand how to study the Bible. There's not many people around you who are Christians that are close to you. Your friends and family don't understand why you became a Christian. For the first time ever, you're seeing your sin for what it is, and it hurts. You're struggling to trust God that he's actually with you in the fight and that he's really cleansing you. Maybe you're a believer for a long time. Maybe you've been a believer for years and you're spiritually exhausted. You read your Bible every morning. You pray throughout the day. You share the gospel with those around you. You go to church and city group every week, yet you don't feel the same as you did when you first became a Christian. You aren't experiencing the joy or the peace or the hope that you once had. To you, the bread of life has seemed to grow stale and the living water stagnant. However, rather than putting out the smoldering wick, Jesus supports it. Richard Sivis was a Puritan that wrote a book on this verse, and he says about the smoldering wick that it's important for us to know that even though a spark is a fire, in its smallest capacity, it's still a, uh, still a fire. It is still a fire. The flame is still present. And Jesus refuses to quench what little flame there is, and instead he fans it. He makes it grow by his grace. We can see this in Jesus' treatment of Peter after he denies him. See, Peter was the first to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah, and he told him that he would never leave him. But then when Jesus, right before he was killed, right before Jesus was killed, Peter denied him three times. And in Luke 22, afterward, he wept bitterly. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It sounds familiar to me. In that moment, Peter was a smoldering wick close to being put out. But in John 21... After Jesus rose from the grave, he visited Peter and the disciples. The disciples were fishing, and they realized that Jesus was on the shore. And so they went to him. And rather than casting out Peter, shunning him, Jesus says, come and have breakfast. Rather than asking Peter why he ran away, Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. Rather than telling P Peter to stay away, he says, follow me. Jesus invited Peter back to himself, even though Peter was worried and weary. In our exhaustion and anxiety, Jesus is calling us to sit with him, to love him, and to follow him. As he fanned the flame in Peter's heart, Jesus wants to do the same in ours. He wants to do the same for us. Take him up on that invitation. I grew up on a farm, and when I was in high school, I worked for my dad in the summers. One of my favorite jobs was raking hay, which is the process of flipping over grass or alfalfa cuttings in order to let them dry out so you can bale them later. The rake was pulled by the tractor, and I, I'd done this quite a, quite a bit before the past summers, and I was 18, so of course I knew everything. 
one day, my dad told me to go rake hay in a certain field. And, I, and before he left, he said, now there's some washouts in the field. Be careful that you don't go flying through there with the rake and break something. Okay? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've heard this before. I've been, I've been there, and it'll be fine. So I go out to the field with the tractor and rake, and I'm just cruising cruising through the field. And then all of a sudden, wouldn't you know, to my surprise, I hit the washout and I did not slow down. Then crash. I stopped the tractor and turn around to see that the tongue of the rake is split in half. I did exactly the opposite of what my dad told me to do. I blew it. I broke a piece of equipment and I couldn't fix it. And so as I'm calling him, I'm, I'm fully expecting him to say, I told you so, didn't I? I told you. I told you there was the washout there. I told you to slow down. I told you to be careful. And you, you broke something that you cannot even fix. But instead, when I told him, all he said was, that's okay. We're going to fix it. And so for the next couple of days, I went with my dad and his hired hand, and I helped them fix it. There was no shame, no guilt tripping, no blame, and no feeling like I had to earn my way back to my dad in our working or personal relationship. How much more gracious is Jesus? How much more gracious is Jesus Christ? In those moments when we know we've blown it, when we know we're at our lowest point, when we're bruised and smoldering because of our sin and circumstance. Jesus isn't there angrily saying, Matt, come on, do better. Read your Bible more. Pray more. Remember all that sin? You better work your way back to me. That's not what Jesus is saying. Instead, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, come have breakfast with me. He says, I have living water for you, and I don't want you to ever thirst again. Jesus wants to come alongside us in our brokenness and bring healing and support. Jesus is lovingly inviting you and bringing about restoration in your heart. He is gentle in his service, and Jesus can do that. Because what he's done is open the door for grace, unearned kindness from God by establishing justice with God. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not grow weak or discouraged until he has established justice on earth. Jesus is steadfast in his service to bring justice. As mentioned earlier, God wants to bring justice to all things. He wants to restore broken creation back to holiness, and he wants to show mercy to us. God has a desire for all people to be saved. But there must be a way for God to both be just and also be able to forgive sin, right? There has to be a payment. There has to be a payment for sin. And that payment is the servant's service in bringing justice. To bring justice, Jesus accomplished all that we can't do and was punished for all that we did do. Jesus perfectly fulfilled all of God's laws and fulfilled each and every prophecy about the Messiah, including this passage. He did not grow weak or discouraged, but he remained steadfast and strengthened by God in his spirit. The moment that Jesus fulfilled all that was required on his part, he took on the full wrath of God. He became weak. God left him and turned away from his son for the first and last time. He sweat blood as he prayed in the garden and took on the moral burden of all sin. On the cross, he was brutally murdered, experiencing the physical toll of God's wrath on sinful people. Once he died, he was in hell for three days, experiencing eternal punishment at the hands of God. But after those three days, by the power of God, 
Jesus rose from the grave, defeating death. He rose from the grave. And in his resurrection, we can be forgiven of sin. And Jesus opens the door for everyone and anyone to be in a relationship with God if they turn away from their sin and turn to Jesus Christ, believing that he is the only one through his life, death, and resurrection that can restore all things back to God. If you do not know Jesus, I plead with you to repent and believe. Turn away from your broken idea of justice and turn away to God's righteous justice in Jesus. Believe that Jesus is your only way to salvation, your only way to eternal life. Jesus is inviting you. Once again, he's inviting you to go to him in your brokenness, and he brings more than just justice. This is the servant king, and he wants to be with us in our despair and walk us through the darkness and into his light. Jesus is steadfast in his service. And if you know Christ, he has already established justice and has brought in a new era of God's grace in you, which drives us to our last point that we see in the text. Jesus continues his service in and through us. Look at the very end of verse 4. The coastlands and islands will wait for his instruction. Christ's service of justice is for all people of all nations to partake in. Look Look back in the passage. He will bring justice to the nations until he's established justice on earth, coastlands, and islands. The grace and service of Jesus extends outside of culture and to people of every tribe, tongue, and nation, which is how we're Christians today. In his life, Jesus did not go to the coastlands and islands himself. However, Jesus commissioned his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations right before he returned to heaven. We are now a part of Jesus' service of bringing the gospel to all people, to proclaim who he is to all people. And that's what it, that's what it means for us to wait. The reality is, is that right now, we are waiting for the day that Jesus returns and will bring his final act of justice and judgment. Though we may think that waiting means stillness, that's not what it means. This is an active type of waiting. As we wait for Christ's instruction, his law, his decree, his return, We are growing in our relationship with him and working by proclaiming the gospel for people who've never heard it, who have never heard his instruction. And as we do this, we must keep in mind the way in which Christ served. He led with gentleness for those who were bruised and smoldering. With those who are not believers, we should be jumping at the opportunity to show on full display Christ's grace and mercy. When we're living life alongside one another as Christians, we should try to live like Jesus, understanding how, one, how each, each of us responds to conflict or to hurt, and that we should, we should know when we're dealing with a bruised reed or a smoldering wick. We can look back at the, at the, at the beginning of this passage in verse 1 and see that those things about God's servant are also true for us in Christ. We are now servants to God. We are servants to righteousness rather than sin. We are strengthened by God. We have his spirit, and we know that he's gentle and steadfast. Jesus is the servant who brings justice, and in his gracious service of justice toward us, we can take part and serve those around us. How beautiful How amazing is it that Christ invites us into his service of bringing justice? Jesus could have saved us and just moved on to the next person. But instead, he invites us, just as he invited Peter to follow him. Just as he told Peter, feed my sheep. Just as he told the disciples, go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've commanded you, and I am always with you. 
I am always with you. We are, Jesus, we are with Jesus in his work. This work that heals the bruised reed, fans the flame of the smoldering wick, and brings injustice to justice. How loving and how gracious is he to invite us into this, to take part in it, to see his mighty service in action. Let's pray. Jesus, as we reflect upon uh, you as a servant who came to save us and bring us justice, God, I just ask that that reality would become more and more true in our lives, that we would realize that in a greater way and that we would apply that and serve others how you served. Jesus, I just pray for those of us who are bruised and smoldering that you would become our ultimate comfort, that we can rest in you knowing that you're gentle and steadfast, and that you want the best for us, you know what's best for us, and you love us more than we could ever love ourselves. Jesus, I just pray that as we worship, that we would glorify your name, and that we would praise you with our whole hearts. In your name we pray. Amen.